Hello, everybody. If you've joined us before, you know that once a month we sit down with our favorite designer, Kate Troyer, to talk about all things renovation and design. In the past, we've covered topics like how to get the most bang for your buck in your renovation, so where to spend money, where to save it. We've talked about what to consider for a renovation of an investment property, backyard renovations. We've covered a whole bunch of topics and we have a link so you can binge our whole series if you want to. We'll be posting that as soon as this is over uh, on the Facebook Live. It'll also be in our monthly newsletter. So take a look out for that. All right. So I am Victoria Dowling. I head up the renovation team for Cross Country Mortgage. We have Kate Troyer with us from Home Slice Living. Thank you as always, Kate. And we're gonna talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart today, and it's renovating historic homes. Um, I, my house was built in 1855 and we gutted and renovated the whole thing. So I'm there with you if you've got a historic home or if you're looking at them or if you love them. And um, so we're gonna talk about that from the perspective of renovation financing and from a design perspective as well. And just to remind everybody about renovation financing, renovation financing allows you to either purchase and renovate a property or refinance and renovate a property. So it's really flexible in what you can do, but the best part about renovation financing is that you're borrowing against the future value of your house. So you don't have to wait 20 years for your home to build equity so that you can borrow it or use all that money you just saved in your 401k. You can use that future equity in your house today to get the projects done in your house that you need to get done to make it truly your home and what you want it to be. On purchases, our down payments are as low as zero to three and a half percent. And on refinances, not only are you borrowing against that future value of your house, but you can borrow up to 97.75% of 110% of your future value. So there's so much flexibility there, especially in a market like this where values just keep going up. So keep that in mind as you're hearing us talk and as we talk about how this can work from a design perspective and from a financing perspective. All right, let's get right into it. So our first category is historical homes and historical societies. And this is a big one. So if you are looking at a home that is in, in a historic district, or maybe it is a historic home itself, you wanna make sure you understand what that historical society does. Different historical societies can do different things. So this is really locally based. This is something that's gonna have a different rule depending on where you are. Sometimes they just have recommendations. So they're there to tell you that, well, around the time your home was built, this is what the paint colors on the exterior would have been. Here's what the siding would have been and things like that. So sometimes they're just there to provide guidance and to help you make that home look the best it can based on when it was built. Sometimes they're there to give specific rules and guidelines like a homeowners association. So they may have to approve the windows that you're gonna put into your house, for example. So we wanted to replace our windows. We had to go to the historical society with a whole bunch of proposals from the contractor. They had to approve the type that was going in there. If they hadn't approved it in my city, they could put a lien against my house so that I wouldn't be able to refinance unless I took out the windows they didn't like and put in the windows they did like. So if you are interested in historic homes, pay attention to that piece of it and the areas that you're looking in. Generally, their rules and guidelines are only gonna be about the exterior of your house. So things like paint colors or trim colors, windows, um, siding, roofing, landscaping, fences, Anything that can be seen from the street view is something that will often fall into their purview. It is really great when there are areas with historical societies. It's not all drawbacks and, and rules and red tape. It's great because it does keep that neighborhood looking like when the homes were originally built and that keeps values up. So just something to be aware of and to know when you're going into it there may be a reason that house is painted yellow and you might not be able to paint it pink. So you just wanna check on that before you maybe make an offer or decide to jump into a renovation. 
besides historical societies, the other thing to keep in mind when you're looking at the old homes are really the foundations and the mechanicals. There is no cheap renovation in an old home. They're going to cost a lot of money and it's gonna cost more than you thought. The foundation and the mechanicals are something that you wanna keep in mind right from the beginning because you're gonna to have to get those done first. You do not want to paint all of your walls, put all your furniture in, and then find out you need to put in a new heating system or redo the electrical and break into all the walls you just put in. And so your order of operations here is definitely to start with those mechanicals. And so what kinds of things are we talking about? Well, first and foremost, you wanna pay attention to the foundation. Um, and a lot of old homes, those foundations have settled and that's perfectly fine. You just wanna make sure that you know it's settled and that it's secure. Because if you do have to do anything to prop it up or to push up the foundation, it can cause cracks higher up in the walls. So you don't wanna have just done your beautiful living room, prop up the foundation and then the wall cracks. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Often, if you are going into an old home and you're gonna be gutting it or pulling open walls, this is a great time to look at electrical and heating too. Old homes in a lot of the country have something called knob and tube, which isn't necessarily, it's, it's not like it's not allowed, but it's not the safest and it may make it difficult for you to get homeowner's insurance. So if you do have knob and tube in your house, this is the time to try and get it out and get some new electrical running in there. That also comes to, you know, all of these old homes weren't necessarily built with electricity in mind. So this might be a time that you want to say, I'd really love an overhead light in this room, or I'd love some wall sconces um, or something to that effect. Heating systems is another big one. Again, this is something you could definitely include in a renovation loan. The heating system may be older. It may be, you know, steam radiators, something that you want to replace or take a look at and make sure it's fully functioning. That's, this is a great time to do that, again, for the same reason. You don't want to open up walls again later. Plumbing as well, you know, we see a lot of people right now putting in the tankless water systems so that you can have water on demand, especially when you're in an old home and the pipes are traveling all over the place, you want that hot water to be able to get to you as quickly as possible. So before we got into the pretty stuff today, I did just wanna talk about some of the nitty gritty things that we run into when you are restoring an old home. So again, whether you're a buyer looking at old homes or a homeowner who's in their house already, if you're in a historic district, check with that historical society first. You don't wanna end up with a lien against the property. And they often have some really great resources. That historical society, they're also the ones who generally know if there are any rebates or local funding you can get at low discounts for certain items. So sometimes the historical society itself might offer something for you to put in insulation or to offset the cost of your windows. Um, so they're a great resource too. And then of course, don't forget to check out those foundational items. But once you've done that, you can get into the fun stuff, which is where Kate Coyer comes in. So <laughs> let's talk about some of our more fun categories, doors and windows. Now I know in our old home, we just put in all new windows and there was like not two windows that were exactly the same size and they were all oversized. So it was a big custom order. Um, but, uh, and this house looks like it also has lovely big windows. One of the things the historical society actually got us for was, if you see these windows have an arch at the top and it, it's filled in with that white uh, panel, our original windows arched up. And so we could only get windows that arched up. So that was also part of the special order, but it looks really nice and I'm glad we did. Um, so Kate, talk to us about doors and windows in historic homes. What, what are your thoughts? Um, so a couple things here, um, one with windows, I know that having black windows is very in right now. Um, and especially on a brick home, I think they look beautiful. Um, so I think there are some circumstances where black windows are awesome, um, but the problem with black windows on the inside is they're probably not going to be in style forever, you know, like most things are not, um, but a white is very classic, right? And it also, from the inside at least, um, kind of helps you to keep that more like classic, more traditional look of the home 
there without being super trendy. And then my one thing with doors are, I think this is, and this is something we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, when it comes to like paint colors and things like that. And our goal today, or at least my goal is to really talk about, you know, how do you take this older home when you probably most likely, maybe you're not everyone, but you have maybe a more contemporary style. And how do you mix those two things together? So I think doors, um, front door and interior doors can be, you know, kind of a fun way to incorporate those two things. So, you know, you want fresh new doors, but maybe instead of keeping them all white, because you're a little bit more contemporary, you go with white doors, but you paint your trim and all of your interior doors in a color. You know, it could be like a bright, vibrant color because, you know, you love those you know, paint colors. Um, it could be something more neutral and muted or even like a black, but it is a really nice way to give a classic home some character um, and a little bit more of a contemporary vibe, but you're not like, you know, that's not something that you're beholden to forever. In five or 10 years when you're sick of it, the cheapest renovation you can do in any home is paint, repaint, right? So that's a really easy way, I think, to get a very big impact and give your home a more like modern characteristic while keeping, you know, the classic vibe still going um, and not have to spend a, a ton of money in a few years when maybe you're looking for something different. It all goes back to paint, right? I feel like every time we talk, I'm like, yes, paint, yep. paint is a way. <laughs> so and painting the trim is such a great option because yeah, you can change it. It's not one of those mm -hmm. things that's a permanent fixture. So if you did something trendy now, five years from now, you're kicking yourself. It can look beautiful yep. today and you can change it easily in the future. Mm -hmm. And to your point about the windows, I know that a lot of the windows now, especially you can get different, you can get like black face on the outside and white facing on the inside. And so that's what we ended up doing because all of our trim was uh, white and we just wanted that to match on the interior. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and, and it is true, like these are all gonna be in different sizes. So I know we weren't really talking about interior doors, but that is something that comes up a lot on the historic homes because often yeah. those door sizes are also not standard. And so you either have to do something where you're going to put in a transom above the door and put in a standard size door, or if you have a local salvage location, um, or antique shop, they often have a whole floor that's just doors and trim that you can go in mm -hmm. and pick some out and find something that fits what your house was. We were lucky enough that the guys who sold us our house had to just collect it, a ton of doors and windows. So we have those in the basement ready to go if we ever decided to change anything out. Um, but yep, doors and windows. I think the important thing to note is they're going to be custom sizes. And so just mm -hmm. be aware of that. And um, like Kate said, go with the trends where you can and where it makes sense. When it comes to furniture and decor, Kate, I think this is gonna be like the biggest one that people have questions about because in some of these homes, you're gonna have, you know, those older moldings and beautiful details that everybody wants to see. And what kind of furniture can you put in those spaces? Yeah, so, you know, one, this is, it's going to depend on, you know, anybody's unique individual style, of course, but just a couple like pointers from my end and when working with clients in this type of situation, I would kind of lean them towards, um, you know, typically you bought this old home because you love that vibe of that antique style home, right? But a lot of us are, you know, style, I feel like style in general has gone a little bit more to this contemporary, cleaner kind of feel. So how do you mix those two pieces together? Because the thing that we don't want, you know, is one, if you, you are more contemporary, you fill your home with traditional stuff that you don't really like, just because it matches the home. Um, or we don't want to go so contemporary that all of our stuff just doesn't fit in with our with our older home and then it just feels off like there's no there's no harmonious balance with all of the things that we own and then where we're placing them in so furniture and decor is a really great way to kind of mix these two things and a couple things that i like one you know when it comes to like things like sofas chairs things like that 
you know, maybe go for something that's pretty neutral. Um, I think you can easily go with something with clean lines that just in a very neutral tone, right? So that that can kind of be mixed and matched throughout the home. Um, and I would also mix and match furniture. So maybe not all from the same place, not in a set, um, but rather kind of pieces you've picked up and curated when you find them and you just fall in love with them. Um, and then another thing, you know, you can look at wallpaper is back in and that's a great example. So maybe you go with something that has a more traditional pattern, but that pattern is in more bright, bold, vibrant colors. That's a little bit more contemporary and fun. Um, you could do this with, you know, accent painting, accent walls and things like that as well. Um, one of my favorite ways to do this is with light fixtures. So, you know, some of your just regular light fixtures could be, you know, more contemporary, clean, modern, but in places where you can add a chandelier or maybe an entrance light, a foyer, something like that, you know, go to your local antique stores, thrift stores and find something, especially if you can find something that's kind of unique to your area and that style um, and kind of mixing those light fixtures with each other. You could do this with table lamps and floor lamps as well some old, some new, um, that's a really nice way to do that. So it's kind of like, just be mindful, like not everything in your home has to be brand new. Um, not everything has to be old, just really a nice mix of those things. I typically would say, you know, sofas and things like that, just me personally, I would prefer those be new, cleaner, you know, um, style wise, because I think it's easier to blend them with other pieces. Um, but you know, like in this picture that we have here, somebody's taken a buffet that is clearly, you know, more on the antique side and painted it white. And that's a really great way, you know, sideboards, things like that buffets that you can use in your dining room, you could use as a TV console, you could use it as an entrance table in your foyer. You know, there's so many things you can kind of mix around and again, paint them in a vibrant color or black or white always looks really nice and crisp and clean. So I love adding and mixing those different pieces in with my new stuff. And I love how you talked about you know, not everything has to come from the same place because mm -hmm. I'd never thought about that before. But if you do, if you walked into Crate and Barrel and picked out this whole set and put it, plopped it right down, it is going to look out of place in an older home. But if, if you're mixing and matching things, then things will start to look a little more cohesive as odd as that is. But that's, it's so right, um, especially when you're decorating an old home. Mm -hmm. And you actually turned me on to some of the peel and stick wallpaper. So for people out there who heard wallpaper and are like, oh, I don't know, that sounds like so much. They have some great options now that we've talked about on previous webinars. And there's some great peel and stick options from um, a few different companies. I'm sure we'll put them up in our newsletter where you can go on and, you know, you like this pattern, you can change the colors and get mm -hmm. them to print that specific pattern in those colors for you in just the length you need it to be for your wall. And they'll send you just what you need to get it done. And it's super easy to do. So I know in our older homes, we often have lath and plaster, which isn't super friendly to work with. But if you're putting up peel and stick wallpaper, you don't have to worry about glue. You don't have to worry about scraping it off and ruining all the lath and plaster later. You're just putting it up and taking it down. It's really easy and it's not that expensive. And it's an amazing way to really transform a space pretty instantly. You put some up on your bathroom ceiling, right, Kate? Or did you put real official wallpaper up there? No, no it's definitely <laughs> peel and stick. Because I thought, yeah. well, I might get sick of this one day. And I really don't have want to have to like peel this off of the ceiling. So <laughs> yeah, it's my new favorite thing. I'm like, oh, what other walls can I put this on? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking about right now, too. Currently, I'm like in my dining room, like, hmm, do you need <laughs> peel and stick wallpaper as well? I think you do. <laughs> yeah. And I love that site that you had sent me that you can pick the colors, because especially as we're talking about historic homes, you know, there are often some really kind of deep, maybe emerald or ruby colors or mm -hmm. peacock blue, like you're thinking about like all of these kind of deep saturated colors, and you can get a pattern in any of those colors, you can have them make it up to be exactly what you want it to be. Um, so I love that site. That was really cool. We'll share I that with that, you guys. Was that Spoonflower? I think it's spoon, I think it spoon was, I looked at spoon flower and I think it was love versus design too or okay maybe it was 
Yeah, I, I know I looked at both of them. They're very cool though. Wallpaper and paint, it always comes back to that. You wanna add an accent yes. that doesn't cost a lot that you can easily change, that's the way to go. Um, and I love that you pointed out in this picture, the buffet, I didn't even notice it, but you're right. That's a buffet that somebody picked up and painted and it's the same color as the other furniture in the room. So it's a, a way that it's just blending, which is awesome. All right, kitchens. This is actually one of our kitchens that we remodeled. Um, oh, it's beautiful. So we did the barn board, which now is like a little dated, but at least it's just kind of on a panel. We can replace that panel. Um, but this room was not like just a dining room. And so this is another thing that I wanted to talk about with old homes is that they weren't made to live the way we want to live today. Maybe the space mm -hmm. isn't as open as you want it to be. Maybe the layout isn't what you wanted it to be. Um, the floor plan is just off. And so when you're going into an older home, you really have to open your mind and not just think about what is this room today, but what could this room be for my family and my needs? And so for us, um, this is a first floor apartment and we didn't need it to have a formal dining room and it didn't have a kitchen it had a, they had put in a small kitchen in the 80s in here of like behind the fireplace they had like put a half wall and had a stove and a fridge it was super tiny and we decided yeah we'd re rather have like a really grand di uh, kitchen that had a seating area so we went ahead and renovated the space to do that and we're lucky enough to be able to do that but you really do have to think outside the box and worry more about what's important for you and your family and less about what was there. You often can't move windows, right? Because we just talked about the historical society. They don't want you really changing the exterior of the house. That's typically all they care about. But you can change the interior. Where is there a door? Where is there not a door? Um, so there was a doorway behind where the fridge is. We closed that off and we're just able to use that whole run for cabinets. Um, Kate, talk to us about old homes and kitchens as far as styling choices and materials. What are your thoughts there? Well, I just wanna say that I absolutely, I love this kitchen and I love, oh, like it's you. so perfectly <laughs> done. Like, I feel like if I wanted to explain it, I could just say this picture is a really great way <laughs> to describe it. Um, obviously one thing that I wanted to talk about was cabinets. Um, and that was, you know, going with the shaker style cabinet, because that can kind of be dressed up to be more traditional or dressed down to be a little bit cleaner and contemporary. And these aren't shaker style cabinets, but my other notes that I have written down are talking again about painting, maybe a dark, more rich color. If you already have cabinets there and, you know, putting all new cabinets in just isn't in your budget a really great way to kind of give that contemporary vibe, but, you know, still having that classic look of the cabinets is painting them, you know, this kind of like rich color. Um, and then, you know, going with, when it comes to your backsplash going, you know, always subway tile is always classic. People say subway tile is out. I would disagree. It's been around forever and subway tile is more of the shape and style of the tile it's you know comes in very many different colors and um, finishes and things like that but a classic subway tile to me is always going to be in or using something like a nice marble um, that it looks kind of like you guys did here and you could do that on the floor as well if you aren't able to keep the floors um, going with like a beautiful, like a real slate tile is a really great way to keep that classic look. Um, but, you know, going maybe with um, uh, dark grout lines or like a black grout or a charcoal grout with the slate flooring, again, gives you a little bit more contemporary look versus a traditional, which might be like a lighter grout that's even more of a white to show that differentiation in the tile. Um, and I just, I mean, really you have this space, space styled so nicely, you know, we've got the, the modern clean kitchen with the beautiful countertops, but then, you know, we have our older fireplace and even just down to, you know, taking these newer things and styling it 
with like the older lamp that's on that desk over there, um, the older picture, you know, it really comes down to those small little elements as well. Mixing in those little pieces here and there just makes such a big difference. Like think about if you had a very modern lamp over on that desk and a very modern piece of artwork, it's gonna completely change the whole tone of the room. And while it wouldn't look bad, it's also, I feel like not, going to blend the sp space seamlessly together like you've done here. So I think it looks awesome. And one other thing I know we talked about on our call prepping for this um, was if you, you know, if you can do this, maybe doing um, panel front appliances so that, you know, your stainless steel appliances aren't like, you know, screaming in your face, but they're a little bit more subdued and kind of in the background, just blending in with the cabinets is a nice way to kind of pay ode to that more traditional style home. Yeah, in my next kitchen, my dream kitchen, we're going to have panel front appliances. I love that look. It just blends mm -hmm. everything in so nicely. Um, and I know you touched on floors. I, so I did want to touch on floors for a second too, because here we were lucky enough to be able to use the original floors from the house so these are the floors from 1855 when it was built this is probably the last time we'll be able to finish them um, but finding tradespeople for your renovation project that are familiar with older homes is super important too um, because for example in this home you know these floors are very thin at this point this is the last time they can be refinished and because we were moving around some things that had been done in the room, there were some spots where there was flooring missing. And so we needed somebody who was able to source some of that older flooring. And normally in a kitchen, I know I'm like an outlier on this, but when we redo kitchens, we've done six of them. When we redo kitchens, we like to put the flooring under the cabinets too, because a lot of the units we redo them are um, investment properties and if we needed to change that layout we want to be able to move it and not have to worry about an area that doesn't have tile under it but here we had to pull up some of that flooring underneath the cabinet so that it could be woven into other parts of the room so that we had enough flooring to keep this room together so keep in mind who you're working with so on a renovation loan we're only looking for really basic characteristics on your contractor we're looking to see their license they're insured they've got some references that are similar to the project you're doing and they've been in business at least two years you do want to do your own checks as well so you want to make sure it's someone who knows historic homes you want to check their reviews i always say check better business bureau and online regular reviews if there are any bad reviews they're going to be on better business bureau um, and you'll find all the good ones online so uh, just be aware of that and keep an eye out for that as well. But yeah, we had a lot of fun redoing that kitchen. And bathrooms yeah, too. Good. Oh, thank you. Bathrooms as well, another great uh, topic to talk about. I know in our house, it didn't originally have plumbing indoors. And so the floor plan had to be changed to accommodate some bathrooms. Um, and so sometimes you're working with a space because it wasn't originally meant for that, that maybe it's too small or too big and you're trying to find a way to work with that space. So Kate, I know on our prep call, you had some awesome ideas for styling a bathroom and decorating it and redoing it so that it looks like it fits in your home. What are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, so um, my first one is, you know, going out and repurposing some sort of antique dresser or again depending on how much space you have it could be a, you know some type of hutch or a buffet um, and and painting it again you know to kind of match your personal aesthetic this could be something bold and bright or it could be something more in like a black um, that always looks great in a more you know kind of classic home um, and I think that's just a way that even if your whole everything else in your bathroom is brand new clean white um, having that older style vanity piece just really does a, a great job of like anchoring the old with the new within that space. Um, and then also, you know, your fixtures and things that you're using. I think this is a great place again to maybe mix. Um, so brass is always like brass is back in again. And, and that's something that, especially when it comes to like drawer poles and things like that is a really easy way to be kind of a little bit more trendy right now. But when you're sick of it, you can always change them out for whatever is, 
you know, a little bit more on trend because that's kind of how hardware and stuff goes. Super easy, inexpensive things for, thing for you to change. Um, another thing would be, I love um, using Edison bulbs and lights. I think that's a great way to kind of incorporate that that old vibe into your new home in many areas, but especially the bathroom. And then also, you know, looking for like antique mirrors is really fun too, because there's so many cool mirrors that you can grab that you can pair with brand new sconces and plumbing fixtures and things like that. But again, you know, paying attention to that old vibe of your home. And if you have it in your budget to use like a marble um, you know, a penny drop or a hexagon or a basket weave flooring in your bathroom it just looks absolutely stunning. And again, it's clean, it's modern, but it's very, very classic. And it, it kind of, you know, depending on where your home was, it could have been there when, when the home was, we'll say built, even though they probably didn't have like a full on bathroom built in there at that time. Um, but it really, again, just, it helps to mix with the old and the new. Great tips. And as we're talking about all of this, you know, all the things we're talking about are completely doable in a renovation loan. I know a lot of times when people think about renovation financing, they're thinking about a house that, you know, doesn't have a working heating system or has a failed septic or a leak in the roof. But renovation loans are really flexible. They can be used for all of these upgrades and modifications and making that kitchen remodel happen or that bathroom remodel happen. And again, these are for purchases or refinances. So if you own a home that you're in and you want to really make it your own, borrow against that future equity, get it done now. Or if you're out there looking, hopefully this can help open up your options because you don't have to find a house that's perfectly redone already and end up in a bidding war or um, find a house and live with a bathroom that you don't love, you know? So keep that in mind when you're out there shopping or if you're a realtor and you're out there taking your clients out, this can really be used to modify cosmetics and make the house your own. Um, but yeah, bathrooms are a big one and kitchens I love too. What do we have next? Oh, questions. So I saw a ton of questions come in. So we'd love to answer the questions that you guys have. Yeah, we got quite a few that came in right off the bat. So I will jump yeah. right on in here. All right, first question. Does a renovation loan require drawing, contractor's estimate, and building permits? That's a great question. And so let's talk about the drawings first. If you are changing the floor plan at all on the interior, we need at least the sketch. It doesn't have to be an official architectural drawing, but the appraiser needs to know where, what the floor plan and the layout is going to be because that's part of his appraisal report. If there is a, an addition going on or additional square footage, then we're gonna need something a little more formal. And again, the more information we can provide to the appraiser, the better. We want them to fully understand the square footage that you're adding, what the new exterior of the house is gonna look like, because we want them to be able to give you the most value possible for what you're doing. When it comes to permits, they don't get pulled before closing, but after closing, you will have to follow any local guidelines for permitting. Um, and the permits will have to be signed off on before we can issue our final payment. And we have to show that they're pulled before we issue our first payment to you and the contractor. All righty. All right, next one is about landscaping. So Miss Tina is not the biggest fan of landscaping. Any ideas for low maintenance fun ideas like she likes contemporary styles, especially orange. So something just a fun way to use it. Kate, what do you think? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah. Well, I am also not a landscaping expert. <laughs> um, but my thought would be is can you do something that's like a low maintenance kind of like garden where if you love more vibrant colors and things like that, you could mix in like statues and things like that, maybe in different colors. Like maybe you could, for example, pick up like a Buddha statue, but you paint it, you know, orange or something like that. Like be creative with the things that you're putting in that area. And then I would just do low maintenance things like shrubberies and then maybe you mix in some, like if you like color and flowers, um, you know, it depends on how much love you wanna to give to them in the summer. Um, but that is something you could do to kind of pop color. Maybe you just do things like pots. 
So you can have like brightly fun colored pots with these, you know, maybe you go more plants over flowers. So that way, you know, the flower buds and things aren't dying and, and whatnot. Um, but that would be a good way to kind of keep it a little bit lower maintenance. Um, shrubbery is always good for that. And then using pots or, you know, statues, things like that. All right. Thank All right. you so much. I don't know. I don't know about orange, but I do know I have found three unkillable plants. So oh. if you want some unkillable plants that grow like weeds, there's bee balm. There is um, a really specific type of salvia. There's one breed of it that just lives no matter what. I'll look it up and get it for the newsletter. And rose campion. Those three, you do not have to water. I know because I do not always water and they still <laughs> live and survive. So I don't know if they're your colors, but it's pink, purple, and red. So hopefully that helps too. All right. Thank you so much. Next uh, question is kind of a twofer and it's all about insulation. So kind of looking for a little bit more information on what to consider when adding in maybe wall insulation where an older home might not have that sufficient of insulation as well as what you're thinking of for energy efficient windows when you need to replace those as well. Mm -hmm. Which is funny, we just put in new windows in our house and you could stand in front of the window and you don't feel a draft, but if you move in front of the wall, you do sometimes. So it's definitely something to look into. And if you are lucky enough to be in the beginning of the process where you're purchasing a house and you are um, gonna be gutting it, you know, yes, now is the time to get that insulation. And just like we were talking about before with the electrical, the heating, the plumbing, you wanna take a look at that and, and get that put in. It can absolutely be included as part of your renovation budget. I know that most states do also have local programs that will help you fund energy efficient renovations at a low cost. So I'm up in New England, I know Massachusetts, um, and I know that Rhode Island both have programs that do that, that are subsidized by the state. So you get a really great low discounted rate to get that stuff done. So if that's the only thing you're doing, you can always reach out to them and, and check there as well on those options. Um, energy efficient windows makes a huge difference in an old home. So one of the reasons we talked about the mechanicals and the utilities early on is because while they're not the fun stuff and the pretty stuff, they are the things that are gonna help with your bills in the long run. And they are the things that are gonna help with the quality of life and the longevity of your home, especially with an older home. So I, I'm a big fan of putting in replacement windows. Anderson has a really great historic home line um, that just like we were talking about earlier, you can do one color on the outside, one color on the inside, and they work, you can clean them. They keep the heat out, they keep the cool out when it's the winter. So it definitely something that I recommend and something that you can absolutely include in your renovation loan. All righty, thank you so much. All right, next question is about the house's trim. How do you source the home's existing trim sizes and profiles when renovating? So I don't know, I don't know if you wanna take that one, Kate. I know we've had to do that in our old home. She's like, nope, not me. Um, so, that can be tricky, right? Because your old home was probably done by hand in a lot of ways, and it's not the same as it is today. So there are a couple of different things that you can do. The first thing is, if you live in a more historic area, you probably do have a salvage or antique shop that not only just has antiques, but has like a whole floor that's just doors and windows and trim. And so you can cut off a tiny piece of your trim, like let's say it's baseboard or trim around your door or something like that, and take it and see if you can find some scraps or some pieces that they have there to help adjust um, what, what you need to do in your home. For us, we got lucky because we took out a wall uh, between our living room and dining room, and then we were able to take the trim that was on the doors there and repurpose it in other places that we needed it. So that's another important thing to think about too, is if you're taking some trim out, don't trash it, save it. You do not know if you'll need it later and you're probably not gonna be able to find that exact thing. The final option is that if you are in a historic area, you're also gonna have some woodworkers that can make trim to match. That's gonna be your most expensive option, but it is an option. It is something that you'd be able to do. So um, 
ask, just you're going to have to do some research. And this is, again, where those historic societies can come into play. They know who does wood turning or, you know, we had to have a whole bunch of balusters made for our stair. Well, we were able to find someone who was able to make those. Um, you're just going to have to reach out to the historic society. They'll have some references for you or start searching online if you can't find any pieces at, say, a salvage or antique shop. All right, thank you. Next question is more about project management, um, looking for advice. How, so looking for like a quick outline or timeline for the renovation loan process. So I'm gonna do this from a purchase perspective because I assume that's what we're looking at. It's not too different for a refinance, but let's say you had an offer accepted on a home in the first three weeks, you'd wanna nail down who's doing the work, what are they doing, and how much does it cost? That's the key to the rest of the renovation loan process, right? So if it's a purchase, you wanna get that information as early in the process as possible. If this is a refinance, you're in the home already, that's kind of your discovery upfront work as well. You just need to nail down who you wanna work with, what you want done, and how much it's gonna cost. Once that happens, then we're able to order the appraisal. And an appraisal on a renovation loan right now is taking about two weeks to come back. So we wanna have all that information to hand to the appraiser because we're gonna ask him to tell us once all this work is done, what will the house be worth? And will the house meet health and safety? And once his report is back, we're typically about seven to 10 days to closing at that point. And once you close on the loan, that's when all the work can start. So Three out of five of our renovation loans allow you to get a deposit check for the contractor at closing for materials. The rest of the money is paid out in draws as work is completed. So they'll do work, they'll get paid in installments as they do work um, until the work is finally done. And you have between, let's say, six to 12 months to get the work completed, depending on your project and loan type. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. The last question we have today is also on existing loans. So on a refinance, my existing loan is a conventional. How does this work with the existing loan? I've heard of FHA 203K rehab, but I assume that is for owner occupied. The property I'm thinking about rehabbing is an investor two unit. So everybody always thinks about FHA 203K. It's the one that most lenders talk about because it's the only program they have um, and they don't specialize in renovation financing. We have five different renovation loan programs. So we have FHA 203K, Fannie Mae Homestyle, Freddie Choice, USDA Renovation and VA Renovation. So we have more options. Fannie and Freddie are both conventional loans. So we do have conventional renovation loan options. When it comes to a two-family investment property, unfortunately, there's not an option for financing that I know of out there. We can only do renovation financing on a single-family investment property. So um, we wouldn't unfortunately have an option for you, but we do have an option for single-family investment or single-family second home. All right, excellent. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And just to remind everybody, we lend nationally. so. We are a national lender. We're happy to help you wherever you might be shopping for a home or wherever you might already be if you need a renovation loan. And uh, we'd love to have you guys on the call. Our next webinar is gonna be about spring maintenance for your home. So we'll see you then. I'm looking forward to warmer weather and flowers on trees. Um, our contact information, as always, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be sending out our newsletter like we do every month as well. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you guys again next time. All right, thank you so much, see everyone. You guys.